If you're trying to make any kind of meaningful, effective change in your life, you've come to the right place. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to We're Talking Shift. Today, we are rolling into part two of a really great interview that we started with Dr. Jade Tita. Now, if you missed part one, which was last week, please hit the brakes, go back, listen to part one, and then come on back over here and check out part two, because we are going to continue our great discussion on what it takes to be a next level human. And Dr. Jade is also going to share a couple of pretty cool and special stories with us. So tune in, but jump back on over to last week's, listen to part one, and then come back on over here. And now let's roll into it with Dr. Jade. Whether you're a next level human or on that next level human path, if you're just like, I want to grow. You can see this in debates, by the way, too, right? Mm -hmm. So again, politics is an interesting thing here. You ever see two people in an argument about politics? Well, next level humans don't argue. They ask questions because they want to learn. They're not interested in winning. They want to learn, they want to get better. This is very different. This is where wisdom comes in. Now, one of the things that happens once you get on this wisdom track is there's a difference between doing a thing, thinking a thing and being a thing. Yeah. Most people think it's uh, the way that we do this is we go, let's take money for example. Um, If I want to be happy, let's say, I think that if I have money, then I'll be able to do all the things that money allows me to do and I will be happy. Mm -hmm. Well, the way it works is really the other way around. It's not have, do, be, it's really be, do, have, right? So I have to be the happy person. Then I will start doing all the things that a happy, fulfilled person will do. This is where the the next part of this powers acronym comes in. Because once you decide I want to be this human, you have got to go out and act that almost like a method actor. You have got to show up and essentially say, I will be the honest human being. So for me, I had to go have some very difficult conversations with my wife at the time. I had to come clean to her and explain to her. And these were some of the most difficult conversations of my life. But how can I be an honest person and make that my religion if I don't act it out? And so the W is wisdom. The E and the R is engagement and resolve. So Here's before, you, before right. we go on, though, I just because I don't want to lose this, I think um, I think it's important, at least my opinion, to distinguish um, for the listeners between wisdom and knowledge. Hmm. So I feel like you know you can. It's kind of like what you explained your path was. You learned all this stuff. And then even though you had learned it all, you had all this knowledge, but you still ended up going through this, you know, this transition, this fallout. Um, So I think the wisdom part that to distinguish the two is the wisdom comes in when you've been able to take all of the knowledge and apply it. You, You know, you've got life experience, you're applying all of the knowledge that you've gained. And now you've become a wiser person because you're, you're utilizing it in your life. You're making your life better. You're able to therefore through personal experience, help other people. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And actually, so uh, one, one way to kind of think about this is information, right? Some of you may have heard this term before, but information is not transformation. And here's why, mm-hmm. because, and, and we've seen this, by the way, we've seen this in the internet age with Google. We have all the information in the world and all it's doing is confusing people further. It's not actually giving wisdom. In fact, the opposite, because what people will do, if you don't have ownership, what will happen is you will simply have an opinion and you will just research and find all the information in the world to validate your opinion. That's what most people are doing. Base level humans and culture level humans are just out there validating their opinions. And they're using information to val- validate their, their preconceived perceptions. Right. right. And so if you look at this by overcoming perception and seeing those stories and owning who you want to be, then it opens up this idea of what you're talking about. Information that is learned becomes knowledge. That's still not really where you want to be. Knowledge plus experience is where wisdom comes in. But if you have a seed story, for example, that tells you a particular thing and you are not willing to change it, no amount of information is going to change that because your information is going to be learned 
under the umbrella of your old perception and just reinforce back your old opinion. And so then you cannot move. How many of us have had this happen where we continue to learn all these things, but we will only take in the information that uh, teaches us or shows us what we already believe. That yeah. is not growth. That is a self-enforced prison for our mind. And this is what most people are doing. Why again? Because they want power and popularity. They're not purpose-driven. They are more into status yeah. and safety than they are into growth. And so you're absolutely right here. So, But true wisdom, once you get to that point, is essentially saying, I know very little, if nothing at all. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite quotes is a quote by Osho that says, the less a person knows, the more stubbornly they know it. And so if you, want, if you want to know if you're falling for this trap, think about the ideas and the way you reinforce ideas. Let's take a couple popular ones. So, you know, let's mm -hmm. take climate change or let's take your, your, you know, since we're on the political thing, your, whatever side of the political spectrum you're on, how many times has you, have you as an individual actually um, gone and checked and searched things that disagree with you? So for example, I'm a naturopathic physician. Let's say mm -hmm. that I don't know, let's take um, a natural compound like quercetin. Now, if I wanted to prove my point, I might go, you know, quercetin, I'll search on Google, quercetin uh, cures cancer. Now, when I phrase it that way, mm -hmm. what do you think is going to show up in the search term? Every article that shows quercetin cures cancer. And so I'm, I am essentially validating my own opinion. Mm -hmm. However, if I search quercetin does not cure cancer, the opposite of my opinion, what do you think is going to show up? all the articles that show quercetin does not have an effect. And so what we really need to be doing with wisdom is looking and challenging our own ideas constantly. This is what we should do. So if I'm a Democrat, I should be reading Republican stuff. If I'm a Republican, I should be reading Democrats, Democratic stuff because the truth is always in the gray. And right. that's what wisdom actually begins to teach you. That if you really want to know the truth is almost always found um, in the middle. And I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, but it is a, a hugely important uh, point. Yeah, no, I agree. I I think that you're spot on. You And I've, I mean, I've been guilty of that myself in the past. Or like I, something in my head that I wanted um, more information on, but I wanted the information that was supporting what I already had in my head. Mm -hmm. So so of course, to your point, you start Googling away and there's everything that tells you, yes, you're right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and go ahead. yeah, and so, um, and the same thing um, with, uh, with politics, uh, you have to, you know, w we watch one particular channel in our house, but then we do make an effort to go ahead and bounce over to the other team and get, try to get some input from that too, so that we've at least got, we can at least make a, a more widely informed decision mm -hmm. and have widely informed opinions about what is going on rather than just only being, you know, f like a feeding tube fed from one source. That's absolutely the, the case. And there's, there's actually a, a, what's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, psychology principle. I call it the dunce effect. And here's ultimately <laughs> what, it, what, it, what it does. We humans, me too, you know, I'm, I'm, we don't, no one can escape this. We have a natural bias towards, towards certain things. And here's what we need to understand. This goes to all the conspiracy theories and stuff like that that are out there. What the Dunning-Kruger effect says that is if you're trying to master a domain, it takes, you have to be very, very knowledgeable in a subject before you learn how much you don't know. Mm. In other words, the less you know about something, the more you think you know, because you know so little. It takes, it takes a pretty substantial amount of knowledge in a subject to actually realize, I don't know much about this subject. So you take things like vaccines and virology and things right. that people have PhDs in and things like that, and you know this much, of course, you're going to believe more stubbornly what you know is correct and think you have it all figured out. Meanwhile, if you listen to experts talk, which drives non-experts crazy because they always use terms like perhaps right. and maybe, okay. these mm -hmm. are what true experts say. And they say, I don't know a lot. And the reason why is because they know so much that they can actually see all the areas they don't know. There's really three areas, right? There's what we know we know. Like I know I know how to drive a car. There's what yeah. we know we don't know. I know I don't know how to fly a plane. 
But then there's what we don't know we don't know, which is 99.999% yeah. of information. And so it, base level humans and culture level humans, be sure when they are, when they are arguing about things like viruses and, and vaccines and things like that and have no medical background at all, it's a good indication that they don't know much. And it's a good indication that they're not being a very good next level human, the next level human part of themselves. Because the like next level human is going to say, you know what? I don't know. I've never studied virology. I've never studied vaccines. I don't even know this stuff. Like, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an artist. I, I, don't, I don't do this. So this is a big piece. And, and by the way, once again, when you're chasing power and popularity, you don't want to listen to what I'm saying about this. All you want is more power and popularity. So you do not care about the truth. Mm -hmm. Someone who's on the next level human path wants the truth. That is their major drive. They want the growth of the truth. They're not trying to prove their point. They're trying to learn what they don't know they don't know. And that is absolutely critical. So yeah. the next phase of this hero's journey, let's call it, or this next level human mm -hmm. journey is once you get to that wisdom phase and you start realizing, I don't know what I don't know, and I'm here to learn, then it's really about choices and actions, engagement, yes. and overcoming fear and failure resolve. This is the part where the work happens. Um, I, I love philosophy. I don't know if you guys know the poet Rilke, but one of the things that uh, quotes that uh, Rilke had said was that sometimes we must live our way into the answer. And that a lot of the most important things in life, we don't get the answers right away. We live our way into the answer. And this goes a little bit into what you were talking about, Lori, that you know, wisdom is knowledge plus experience. And sometimes that experience takes time to gather. And so we live our way into the answer. Well, how do we do that? We make choices and take actions in alignment with our honor code. This is why the honor code is so important. This is why ownership is so important. Once I decide I'm going to be a thing, I must take, make choices and take actions from that perspective. That's in the engagement part of this. And then what's going to happen? I'm going to run into individuals or situations or patterns or emotions, oftentimes repeated patterns, repeated mm -hmm. emotions my, from my old self and I'm gonna run smack dab into the same thing. And that is the resolve part. That's the part where it's like, I'm gonna get knocked down and I'm gonna have to get back up. And every time I experience the pain and the suffering, especially if it's a recurrent pattern, I have the opportunity to learn. And life has a funny way of doing this, right? I know most people listening will, will get this. It first starts out by whispering in your ear, right? And if you don't pay attention, it'll tap you on the shoulder. If you don't pay attention to that, it will start yelling at you. And if you don't pay attention to that, it will kick you in the stomach so hard that you are literally knocked off your feet and at rock bottom. And at that point, hopefully you get it. That is the, that's what I call the midlife awakening. Alan mm -hmm. de Baton, which is another one of my favorite philosophers says that the midlife crisis is the final throes of adolescence. Most people, go right back in to their old way of doing things. Yeah. We have people live to their 80s and 90s who die as adolescents. Most of them do. A next level human essentially says, I am going to wake up from this. And I understand that in order to wake up, I have to confront my fears and my failures and my dysfunctional patterns. And so the most important part is coming up, but let me just rewind real quick, perception, ownership, wisdom, engagement, resolve. We have to change our stories, perception. We have to own the human we want to be, ownership. We have to figure out the things that we need to understand as a result of owning who we want to be. And then we have to engage life and confront failures. And in time, as we go through this power, power, power acronym, we start to master something. And then the most important part comes. This is the purpose part. This is what drives everything to its conclusion. This is why Lori is probably doing what she's doing right now, talking to me and why I am talking to her and why we are talking to all of you. The S is sharing. 
we as humans, in order to realize purpose, have to understand that life is not about what we can get out of it. Life is really about what we can give to it. And so once we get that, once we understand that this life journey that we walk through, the perception, the ownership, the wisdom, the engagement, the resolve, the living our way into an answer, the solving of our own pain, the figuring it out, once we understand that, we must transmute that to other people. It is perhaps the entire reason we are on the planet as human beings in the first place. If we're chasing power and popularity, then it's all about us. That is what makes it a base level human and a culture level human. Once we want to share and make the world better in the, in the way that we can, we have transcended. We are now a next level human or on the next level path. And we have sought to find people who have experienced the same pain that we have and help them understand how to heal it within themselves. And at that point, that's when we actually start healing our pain throughout this whole process. You're not gonna all of a sudden feel better. The only time you begin to feel better and have a sense of fulfillment and joy is when you are able to take your life lessons and teach them to other people to heal that pain in others. And by the way, this concept is a part of every religion you could possibly imagine. This has been with, humans have known, this is nothing new that I'm saying here. Humans have known this since the dawn of man, that our job on this planet is to not simply take care of self, but to integrate others. We humans, just by our very nature, we are not islands unto ourselves. Take away other humans, we each go crazy. Mm -hmm. So the idea that we are trying to live in our own silos and set up teams is a huge problem. Our job here is to make the world better for other people. That's our legacy, not in an ego standpoint. Not from the standpoint of look at me popularity or mm -hmm. I want to win power, but I am going to do this simply because I have the humble recognition that I have certain strengths that I can bring to the world to make life better. And that some people may never, ever get that lesson unless it comes from me. Even if Lori and I are teaching the exact same things if she does not speak her purpose and share in the way that she uniquely can, some people will never ever get the lesson. And the same is for you and the same is for me. And so the sharing piece is the thing that everyone misses. The sharing makes life worth living. And so a next level human is really someone who grows themselves to evolve the world. And that's really why we're here. That is beautiful. It really is. And I, I think that, you know, the sharing you could um, like in my mind, I I expand on that as you know, it means it means um, it can mean different things to different people. I mean, we all have different things to share, different ways to share them, I think. Uh, but all of all of the ways that we are each individually moving through our lives is a demonstration. And so we share by our demonstration, whether it's positive or negative, you're still sharing. And so I think um, becoming very um, awake and aware of what, how you are showing up in the world, because that is something that you're sharing. That is your contribution mm. right there. So, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a stay at home parent. And, and that's your whole passion and purpose, which is wonderful because I don't know what could be better than raising, you know, making people. I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's like the greatest contribution I think we can have, but, but it is a contribution. It is what you're sharing is the people that you are creating, the people that you are influencing, that you are getting ready to go out into the world to be part of society. So, or it could be as big as, you know, you are doing something great for all of humanity. I don't know, but yeah, it's all, it's all, I agree with you. I think it's because it's across all uh, religions and, and nations and cultures, it is like a need, a deep human need of the soul. Mm. And that's where that fits into. And I think that people that are just can never seem to find their, their peace and their happiness and their joy at any degree are 
what I've observed, people that haven't figured out how to contribute something beyond themselves, to share something good beyond themselves. It's like you said, they're still kind of islands under themselves and you just can't as a human being, as a spiritual being, it's not enough. Yeah, well, look, I mean, we all we all know, and it's not a judgment, I certainly have done this as well. So just mm -hmm. ask yourself, do you think that it's all about you as, a, as an individual. That's what most people are, are all about. Let me get mine. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. We can all relate to that, right? You know, we, we can all understand wanting to, you know, be loved and appreciated. It's just incredibly ironic that the way to get that is to give it. And what most people don't understand is that, you know, we see it all the time. Well, me and my mom have never gotten along. She's never done X, Y, Z. She's been this way and she's been that way. And Usually the answer is if you want your mom to love you, then love your mom, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, this person has done this. They're so toxic in this and this. And the answer is, and people don't want to hear this, but the answer to a toxic human is to realize two things. If you continue to expose yourself to toxicity, then you yourself are toxic. This, that is incredibly important uh, to yeah. sort of understand. And the second thing is, which goes along with the first one, is if you want to... Um, be the antidote to toxicity. You don't complain about toxicity. You become the antidote. In other words, the best revenge is not to be that way. That is a Marcus Aurelius quote. That is what we're here to do. Maybe that you were being exposed to, you know, a, a, a dysfunctional mother so that you could overcome that dysfunction to teach other people um, that. This is what we're meant to do. Right. Perhaps your pain and your suffering, the thing that you're complaining about, perhaps you were given that as a gift so that you could transmute it. You could change it. You could create something more beautiful out of it. Life is not supposed to just go our way as humans. In fact, I honestly believe that your pain is being given to you to use towards purpose. And here's one thing I'll say about purpose, because I, I, because you alluded to this, and I think it's such a beautiful point you're making, and I just want to make sure everyone understands. Purpose, many people think purpose is about this, what Lori and I are doing now. Most people, their job is not their purpose. I'm lucky that I get to do this. My purpose is uh, sort of in, in engaged or in, intertwined with my work. Most people, that's not the case for. The vast majority of people, their job what they do to make money simply finances their purpose. Their, mm -hmm. Your purpose is not some big thing like I'm gonna make rockets to go to Mars. You know, like, you know, it's not about I gotta do this amazing thing. Your purpose is the way you show up for people in every single thing you do. And I'll show you an example of this in a story because it's the, it's the biggest example of purpose I've ever seen. I'm sitting in a Whole Foods, it's about five o'clock, I'm in Santa Monica, two, two people did not show up you know, so I'm sitting there five o'clock rush hour, Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. There's only two lanes open in the whole store. I'm number three in line at my lane. There's about five people behind me. There's a guy in front of me. And then there's an elderly woman checking out at the counter. And there's a young 20 some year old boy checking her out. Well, she has dementia or something because every time he scans an item, she gets confused and says, wait, that's not mine. I don't want that. Put that back. And she's incredibly confused. Now, everyone in line, right? This, by the way, this goes on for about three to five minutes. When you're standing in line, that is an agonizing time. And everyone starts to get a little annoyed and their annoyance turns into agitation and their agitation starts turning into anger. Right. And the guy behind me turns around to me and goes, can you believe this? Incredibly angry. Now, by this time, I started to watch the cash, mm -hmm. the guy who's running the cashier, the one that's checking her out. And he is so incredibly kind and patient and he starts to joke with her and he goes oh my god look how good this this grapefruit looks i mean i, I wish i had this grapefruit he's making jokes and he's just being so kind to her and she starts giggling and what ends up happening is all these annoyed people in line their anger goes back to annoyance goes back to agitation and all of a sudden goes to elation and happy and they're laughing and they're and we're all having a good time everyone in this line and now we're all pulling for her and now nobody's in a hurry everyone just wants this woman to be looked after and who did this this young 20 year old kid so when i got up to the line i say to him i go you know what or he says dude i'm so sorry you had to wait and i was like 
I have never seen anything like that. I am, I, I'm so in awe of you. I want to be just like you. And he looked very confused and he goes, I just, I just, I don't know. It's like, I, I, I like to make jokes out of life, you know, and I saw my own grandmother in her. Mm. Now I'm telling you all this story and I'm telling you this story. I have no idea who this kid is. I don't know his name. It was a one, but I have told this story. I've written about this story. Countless people in lectures that I've given have heard this story. The ripples that he created that day yeah. have changed me. You all have now heard that it's changed you. That's what purpose is. And he can show up and choose that in any moment with everybody. That's actually what purpose is. It's not some grand you know, thing where I have to create. It can be, but for most people, it's the way we show up for our fellow human. Yeah. That is what purpose is. And the degree to which we embrace that, our unique ability to do that, is a degree to which we will have fulfillment and joy in our lives. And when we die at the end of our lives, because that's the bottom line here, mm -hmm. when we go, what we want at the end of our lives is to be proud of the way we lived. Now, are you going to be proud of someone who's been whimpering and whining and blaming and complaining because your mom didn't love you right? Or are you going to be someone that's like, I got the mom that I needed so that I could use that information and that change to make life better for others? That's how you end up turning that to good. That's how you end up being proud of yourself. Mm -hmm. That's how you end up with purpose in your life. It's a simple choice. It's not something you find. It's something you wake up with and decide. I am going to go out and give mm -hmm. life my healing presence in the way that only I can. Right. I'm going to be this person. I'm going to be this. I'm going to demonstrate this. I'm going to breathe this. That is such a fabulous story. That young man literally was demonstrating his purpose. He, he completely changed the energetic current that was going on. He completely changed it. And it wasn't even, it wasn't like he went, Ooh, I gotta, I gotta change this. My people are getting mad. He was just honestly, authentically doing his thing. Yep. Beautiful. That's so amazing. Beautiful. That's amazing. Um, okay. I know that we are, uh, we're, we're like coming close to time here. There's just a couple things I, I want to sneak in and then I'm gonna have to save the, the rest for like a part two. Hopefully you'll come back again. Um, but I do remember, I thought it was super cool. You had a story, a little story in here that I could so relate to. And I think it was in engagement and it was when I believe your uncle threw you into the pool. <laughs> to teach yeah. you right yep so yes this this is a way for engagement right most of us think uh we've we've heard these sort of statements it's like uh rise to the occasion or leap and the net will appear right but oftentimes in life it's really about we have to act choose and act in a direction before we even know the outcome. And so the way this story was, is when I was a kid, the way I learned how to swim as I was going around the pool, dipping, dip, dipping my feet in the water, running back, I was terrified of the water. And I kept going and putting my toe in again and then coming back. Well, my uncle, who was a little bit crazy, he goes, Jade, what are you doing? Like, just jump in. And I was like, no, no, I, I'm, I'm scared. So he comes to me, picks me up and just throws me in the deep end of the pool and I'm a little kid. And so I freak out. I come up, you know, arms moving this and that. And I go over to the edge of the pool and I run up and I'm hitting him and screaming and crying. And he, and I said, what did you do that for? And he goes, Jade, Jade, you just swam. And I stopped and I looked around and I was just like, Oh my God, I did. Now, I oftentimes think of that because I go, well, how long would it have taken me? Mm -hmm. And by the way, by the end of that day, I was going off the high dive of the diving board. And it is wow. a lesson to me of how yep. powerful overcoming fear is. And yeah. that sometimes we need to leap. It's not leap and the net will appear. It's right. leap and weave the net as you fall. Yeah. Yeah, That's basically how engagement mm -hmm. works. And so the idea is, if you are listening to this, and I'm so glad you brought this up, Lori, but if you're listening to, to Lori and I have this conversation, and you're having an old perceptual challenge or a relationship challenge or all of this, and you're waiting for things to be completely right, you don't have to. You just have to do anything different than that old story in a positive direction that you can right now. You yeah. just have the difficult conversation. You just do the thing and you mm -hmm. figure it out. This is what engagement is all about.
Yeah. And I, I think uh, I love that story because I have almost an exact same story um, myself. Only how old were you about? Um, I must have been what, six, seven, maybe. OK, well, I was like 15. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, yeah, I hate, I was afraid of the water. I hated the water. I never learned to swim as a kid, even though my mom put me in swimming lessons, but my mom was afraid of the water. So it just like transferred, you know, but, um, I'm 15 and I'm, I'm out on a boat with a boyfriend and a couple of friends and they're water skiing. And I'm, I'm not, cause I don't like lakes. We're in the middle of the lake. Boyfriend is out on the skis and one of his friends is in the boat, you know, driving the boat or whatever. And as the boat is stopped while we're waiting for him to get his skis on or get, you know, get ready, um, the friend, his friend, not mine, comes over, picks me up and lawn darts oh, no. me <laughs> off the boat into the middle of the lake. I never liked this guy in the first place, but that <laughs> I, I I thought I had some serious dark thoughts about that. Yeah. However, <laughs> however, Dr. Jade, I came up to the surface, by the way, holding a pair of expensive sunglasses in my hand that boyfriend had given me to hold. So I'm going through the air with the glasses into the middle of the lake and I am pissed and I come up and I swim to the damn boat and then he lifts me up and puts me back in and I'm sitting there like a drowned rat, you know, with the sunglasses still, by the way, not only did I swim, I didn't lose the Ray-Bans and, and I was so angry. I just hated this guy. I was so pissed. <laughs> And it wasn't really until like, I don't know, 15 years ago. So th this happened a long time ago. Um, I realized that I, I actually had to like energetically send a thank you to that asshole because who knows if I would have realized that I actually could do something that I thought I couldn't do and I was afraid to do. Put me in the middle of the lake for sure i would drown i mean you know it was just a given um so it was one of those stories where i just literally had to <laughs> learn in the moment <laughs> i guess he figured if i was actually really going to drown he'd just jump in and save me kind of like your uncle yeah. but um but yeah something like that if you get over the part that was so scary that you were so afraid of and you realize what you just accomplished that you didn't know you could you you were maybe afraid to engage, but the universe had another plan and said, no, you're engaging. I love that story so much, Lori, because it, it <laughs> demonstrates that. And, and the degree to which we will embrace those things and the degree mm -hmm. to which you came back and said, wow, I'm actually pretty um, grateful for yeah. that. And, yeah. and think about it, if we extrapolate that a little bit, right? Think about all the disappointment and hurts and fears that we've experienced. And it, to me, that story completely illustrates what we're talking about. You have the power, the perception change to just simply go, that was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Or I will make this one of the best things that ever happened to me. I have one, one more story, if you'll allow, because it's yeah. powerful. Yeah, but here's, yeah. here's my favorite example of this. Um, so I don't know how old all of you are. I'm 47, right? So I'm, a pro, I'm coming up on 50. But when I was coming up um, in the 80s, I would sit there and have my cereal and I would sit there and look at the milk cartons and there'd be little pictures of kids on um, missing children on these milk cartons. I don't know if, if any of you remember this, but for me, I was always intrigued by that. And I went back and looked at the story behind it. So this is the story of a woman who sends her child off to school. The child comes back from school, gets off the school bus. That's the last he has ever seen. Basically they find him later, raped, murdered, you know, worst thing that could potentially ever happen to a parent. Now, as a result of this, the deepest pain any of us could possibly imagine. Now imagine, this is back in the 80s. So what this woman does to deal with this pain is she, imagine what she had to do. She had to go to the milk lobby. She had to talk to the milk industry. She had to go to Congress. She had to go to state legislators. She had to move heaven and earth to find a way. Now, we're, this wasn't the the, when the internet wasn't around right. here. Right. And she moved heaven and earth to put children on these milk cartons so that when I'm sitting there looking at this and eating my cereal, I can be like, oh, that's the kid across the street. Looks just like the kid across the street. She saved thousands and thousands of children with this. This is an example of taking pain 
and turning it into a deep purpose for other people. Mm -hmm. This is what life is about. So you have that ability right now. Cause I know one thing I know, I, I know this about Lori. She knows this about me and we know it about all of you. You are suffering in some deep way right now. You have a choice of what you're going to do. Suffering can be a source of meaning for others and a path to purpose for yourself. It only takes a choice. Yeah. That's awesome. That is awesome. Do you, I know we, uh, I, we're over time. So last question, then I'm going to promise I'm going to let you go. Do you have a going rogue story to share with me? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I basically, I shared one, right? Okay. Where, so that story of um, my um, divorce. But one of the <laughs> other ones that was really important here was um, when I was getting ready to go to medical school, uh, I found out along the way, I mean, I remember I told you guys I was a personal trainer and I was teaching nutrition. It was very much into fitness. And I just never, I just always thought, you know, um, being, being, uh, going to medical school, I would learn more about nutrition and more about exercise. And I was very shocked at the time to, when I looked at the curriculum to essentially realize that this was not taught in medical school at all. There was not one course in nutrition taught and no courses in exercise taught. And at this point, now looking back, I can be happy about it, but I was devastated. I was depressed. I was confused. I took a whole semester off basically trying to figure out what am I going to do now? Because I knew I did not want to be um, uh, someone who pushes drugs and surgery. By the way, there's nothing wrong with drugs and surgery. It just wasn't in alignment with my purpose. And I almost went to traditional medical school. But then my brother introduced me to an alternative school that taught uh, primary care physicians lifestyle medicine, naturopathic medicine, which is what I studied. Mm -hmm. Now at the time, so this, I decided to make a huge leap and I was depressed the whole time. Even when I did it, I was unsure because everyone was telling me that, remember this is back before natural medicine was a thing that right. people were saying, this is witchcraft. This is like, but I took that leap. And so in a sense went very rogue against my mentor who was very hurt against my uh, family um, pretty much did you know, went in a direction, just trusting that this is where I wanted to go, not knowing how it would work out. Now, fast forward, and that decision that I agonized over and was so depressed over has served me so incredibly well. And it was really about the alignment. This goes back to ownership. Even as a youth, I owned the idea that I wanted to teach health and fitness, and I didn't care what it looked like. Mm -hmm. And this was a big, big deal for me. And it was one of the first lessons for me and probably the precursor to several other things, starting a business, going through my divorce, where I was just like, I know I can make this magic. I know I can turn something good out of this. I don't have to, um, the way I look at it is the life you imagine can always be reimagined. And I learned that in that moment that I could reimagine the plan that I had. And so those of you who are just lost someone or going through pain or lost a job or whatever you're going through, the life you imagine can always be reimagined. And the degree to which you can do that is the degree to which you will set yourself free and on the path to purpose. And that's what I was able to do. So I love this idea of going rogue because oftentimes going rogue is really like going real. And you know, it's like yeah. literally tapping into my authentic self and discovering something about myself that I never would have realized otherwise. Right. That's a great story. And I think, uh, especially when it comes to medicine in that whole field, because going off the traditional path in, in, in our society, it's risky. It, you, it's not easy, especially like you said, at the time you did it, um, that was still, you know, holistic health and alternative health and all of that was still very, very, yeah, considered, you know, it wasn't considered credible, shall we say. Yeah, and let, me, and let me tell you this, Laura, it's funny. And this is just another thing about ownership. I, it's still in a lot of fields. Some people see it as like more credible than conventional medicine. Others mm -hmm. don't. But throughout yeah. my career, I've been called everything from witch doctor to um, not a doctor to, you know, just not a real. And you know what my response to all that is? And this is, this is not a response out of self-defense or anything like that. It's literally, thank you. And the mm -hmm. reason why I say thank you is because that was a choice. That's mm -hmm. how powerful ownership is. Ownership, when you really own who you're going to be, it is so powerful that even when people tell you, you suck, you can't do it, this and that, you just go, thank you. Because I did that consciously. 
So I don't mm -hmm. care that you think I'm a doctor or not a doctor. This is the choice I made for my life. And that's why it was such a powerful thing. So again, ownership saves you from the need to be popular or powerful. Ownership is the first step to that purpose. And because I was so purpose driven, I could care less that someone thought whatever they thought of me. In fact, it was a point of pride for me to say, thank you. I remember I had this one, this one thing where someone online said to me, you're, you're a witch doctor. And I said, thank you. It was a <laughs> conscious choice. I love that. Probably not at all the response they expected. <laughs> exactly. And you, you probably didn't hear much after that from them. Nope, did not. <laughs> yeah, so mind your P's and Q's, person, because I've got special <laughs> powers. <laughs> and now I know who you are. <laughs> oh my God, that's funny. Um, okay, so I am going to just say before I have you tell everyone where they can find you, this book is amazing. Um, and what's super cool about it is it looks like a massively, it looks like a novel, you guys, but really there's a few pages where Dr. Jade talks, goes into um, more of a, what we talked about with, um, with powers. And then the rest of the book is literally 365 days of, of messages and information that you can that you can just pick one for each day of the year and just read that page or two that little bit and then you can sit with that you can contemplate about that and use this as actually a way to help you start to shift your mindset and and um, shore up all of these areas um, perception and ownership wisdom engagement and resolve and sharing it's it it covers everything and i think if you really are interested in becoming a next level human this is this book um, and and all of dr jade's um, teachings will really help you just get on the path and stay on the path it's really awesome so i love your book and i really love how much time you spent with us today thank you and where can everyone find out more about you and your services? Well, Lori, now I love you too. I love you back. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, for all of you who want a little bit more from me, at Jade Tita is uh, where you can find me on all the social media. I spend a lot of time on Instagram. Um, feel free to DM me there. I do my best to answer those, those questions on DM. Just give me a little bit of time because sometimes they can add up. And then jadetita.com. Um, is where to find me online. And then I have my own podcast called the Next Level Human podcast um, that you can catch me there as well. And so again, thanks so much for having me. Thank you. So everyone, uh, thanks for hanging out with me and Dr. Jay Tita today. I know that you found value in this. So please make sure that you post a review and, uh, and, and give us a rating. That really helps inspire other people to check it out and hear all of the good shift being shared here on We're Talking Shift. So make sure to subscribe if you haven't so that you don't miss anything coming up down the pike. Also, until next week, Stay feisty, my friends, stay healthy, and please go make some epic shift happen in your lives. And that goes for you too, Mr. Gary V.